Okay, well, since I've terrified you all with magic, let's now delve into the world of uncertainty. Oh, so now uncertainty, this is again, we're, we're thinking about this from an AI perspective. Do that later, right? It, the VS Code will still be there tomorrow, I hope. Uh, <laughs> just learn to do it in Notepad like I had to. Oh, I had to. <laughs> Back in my day, we climbed uphill both ways to have a punch car. Anyways, so getting back to our lecture, we have some of the issues, right? Again, this is stuff that we talked about with like knowledge representation, and we were starting to see some of the limitations of logic, and you will see them as you start to implement them, and yes, right? Uh, but we were talking about it from a planning perspective last week. And so some of the big issues is just the same things that we were dealing with. Like these are, we are hitting upper bound limits as we try and do AI at a, at a, a humanistic level. Like that's just nature of the beast. So yeah, yeah, if you're dealing with a logic agent, you have to check every possible explanation or evaluation and it, could turn into an exponential problem where now you're just waiting five minutes for an answer of, do I recommend this movie to a user? Why? Because you have a billion users and you just keep, you're adding a billion movies every month, right? And, and then you've got just the big problem of what happens if there's no solution, right? So all this stuff kind of becomes a big issue because everything that we've sort of talked about was in this completely observed environment where we know the, the, we can map out all the possible situations. But if you go back in time to like our first lecture, I talked about, oh, we don't evaluate the whale falling on our agent's head because it's so improbable that we just don't evaluate it. Well, what if we need to, right? Uh, and so, okay, let's, here's some examples, right? Let's try and kind of think, oh, well, maybe we're, we're wanting to use AI in the medical field uh, to identify, you know, what's going on in a patient. Okay, maybe I make the rule that if a, stu uh, a student, a, a patient comes into the office uh, complaining about uh, a toothache. All right, well, I could make a rule that implies, you know, a uh, toothache implies that the patient has a cavity. What's wrong with this problem? Not all toothaches are cavities. Not all, toothache, yeah, not all toothaches are cavities, right? Uh, there's a number of reasons why your teeth may hurt, right? You may get a cavity. You may actually have a gum disease. You may have just gotten punched in the face or and you have a chipped tooth, right? All these things and probably more, right? There's tons of different things that could be developing or causing this. And so, again, this is that, which one is it? I don't know. And you see that it forms into these big, elaborate variables. Again, this is that limitation. Well, maybe it's because I did the rule wrong, right? What if I flipped it? Oh, you know, if you have a cavity, that would imply you have a toothache. I know that that's not really helping us in a diagnostic perspective, but from a logical representation perspective, we could try that. But again, that's also still wrong because just because you have a cavity doesn't imply you have a toothache. Uh, you know, I, so you get to see a little bit of my world. You know, my dentist has told me I need to brush a little extra hard here because something might be brewing, right? Well, if I get a tooth, or if I get a cavity, right, am I just immediately going to have a toothache? I don't. I might not know. I might not know if I have one until. I go see my, my dentist, uh, you know, the next round. By the way, please, just because I was a dumb college student once, please go see a dentist. You, you do not want six uh, fillings when you finally go back to one. There's my life lesson for you. Anyways, moving on. So why, why okay, well, why are there limitations to logic? Well, again, it is these exponential things, and we as just developers are lazy not in a bad way or a mean way or anything like that, right? It's just now you're starting to see, and again, this is what you saw in problem set four as you were starting to expand on your static eval, right? As you started to getting 
or as you started getting more and more exhaustive or adding in much you know, subtler cases, right? At some point, you sort of went, I'm done, uh, hopefully, right? Uh, and so, yeah, it becomes too much work. Or you don't know, right? Again, I'm talking about dentistry. Who here knows a lot about teeth? Right? Not, not, you know, because we're math people, right? We know, we know computers and we know keyboard shortcuts on software, right? That, that's our skill set. So the problem becomes, right, as we try and implement these things, you, you'd have to have a domain expert around the entire time to make sure you're doing it properly. Uh, and then the same thing, we just may not know we need to implement or evaluate certain things. Again, think about my example of what happens if someone who is a new user on Netflix, you know, visits the platform. If you only implement recommendations off of the assumption that your users have already used it and liked p things, you know, then you don't have anything for that special niche case. Uh, so suddenly, it's again, we have sort of these problems. It's, it's not a negative thing. It's, it's just more the limitations. So that's where when we start building out AI, again, we have some uncertainties about whether or not a move or an action or a thing may be worthwhile or an approach. We may not know if a move is the right move. So what do we do? Well, we add in some degree of belief. We have some assumption going on there, but it doesn't, it no longer becomes a perfect assumption like end all be all, but some element of probability. We're going to make some guess. So this is again, I'm using sort of IBM Watson and over here, this is open AI when they first came uh, on the stage uh, at Dota's inter the international, right? When Watson was on Jeopardy, how they determined whether or not it should buzz in was on some threshold, right? And they picked, I think this is just 50%, but like it would not buzz in if all of its responses had a low probability. OpenAI, on the other hand, if you, again, you should definitely, no matter, even if you don't like video games, like I would still strongly recommend it because it's, it's hilarious. Uh, when they were using, uh, you know, probability on their end, they thought it would be a great way to trash talk. So in the game, uh, I think within the first three minutes or so, they had already said they had a probability of winning 90% of the time. And it's, again, you're, you've got thousands, if not millions of people watching uh, this thing, and here's a robot being like, I got you, game over, right? And I think it, the, the game went on for like 30 minutes. So like within three minutes, it's already doing trash talk. Uh, hilarious in my perspective. So again, this idea though is like, it's making some estimations, it's making those assumptions, but based on probability rather than a, a, a factual approach. So this is kind of, some of today's lecture is a lot of me helping explain my idea of probability. You know, hopefully you've done a little bit of it by, you know, discrete math terms. But again, where does probability sit now in this idea of AI. So how we can kind of view it and frame it, right? I've got a lot of props today, and that's where this comes into play, right? So if we're starting to look at, say, uh, dice as just a, a very simple, basic probability perspective, right? How do I determine the probability of landing on a six? Well, theoretically, I could do the math to show that. But one of the ways that we think about probability is it is an observation of events, right? I have this dice. What is the probability of it rolling on a six? Well, one way that I can do this is I could go out and map, oh, well, here's all of the possible answers that I could be working off of or results. And then, I do that. I just tally them up, and I do this over and over and over again until I get to a point that I'm happy, right? 
I'm not going to do this for too much longer, but right, four. And I can continue to make this same, same approach. If I do this long enough, right, if I am able to repeat this for some law of large numbers, I'm effectively going to get an approximation of it. I'm not going to get a perfect, oh, one in six chance, but I may be able to get some number that is super close to one in six. And now I've essentially got that same kind of probability mapping through observation. So again, this is that same kind of approach. Now, this is where, again, we know dice. That one makes sense. If I were to show you this die, specifically, it's a special die, uh, has a magic trick. Exactly. That's why it's magic. You can't see it. right? I have a special die. And if I were to roll it, I can guarantee you, without even guessing, it will always land on a five. Would anyone like to guess why? It's five everywhere. Now, I also have one. Not always. That one's weighted. That is very, if you can, you can see there, that six on there has a, a wonderful thing versus the one does not. Uh, ah. Okay, I'm done with show and tell. Uh, no, so again, you could, you could see this through observation is what I'm trying to get at. And that'll be a, a recurring theme as we get through this uh, entire uh, uh, lecture. So as we were, again, when we think about the law of large numbers, right, as we move to our limits, right, that's where we ultimately find a pro these values, right? In math, you started doing limbs and all that stuff. We don't have limbs in real world, right? We don't have limbs. We have observation. And so again, if I were to roll 100,000 or roll some dice 100,000 times, in theory, again, so long as you're not cheating, right, I should be, again, this should, this die, uh, I, I have not modified it. It's just a stress tool, right? It should land on everything one-sixth of the time if given enough rolls, so that's where I'm now going to ask, okay, well, let's say I roll my, my squishy die, right, five times, and I record each one of the numbers. One roll lands one, 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 and the other one is uh, six, three, one, five, five. Which one is more random? In that order. Oh, well. The answer is yes, you are correct. Both of them are equally weighted. Why are equally random? Why? Uh, let me, there we go, a new one. Uh, right, so in either case, it doesn't really matter what the last roll was. It doesn't change what the new roll will be. It might, if you look at it after distribution, you can see that, but generally it won't actually matter to a specific permutation. Yes, it does not matter because, and this is something we'll talk about on Thursday, on a Wednesday, each dice roll is independent. It doesn't matter that if I landed on a one the first time, the second roll doesn't care, right? Again, that's me rolling uh, the second one had no impact on that first one, right? I roll... I land it on a four, I roll again. That three, in theory, had no impact on that. Yes, you know, physics and the fact that I picked it up and it was orientated, whatever, right? They're independent, again, from a theoretical standpoint, of each other. Here's how I like to think about the probability world. And specifically, I like to think about it in this shape. This shape helps kind of get my mind to wrap around it. What we're essentially attempting to do is we have what I, you know, again, I call it a universe. And if we look at the two colored areas, I have a blue area, I have a red area. If I were to sum up just the likelihood of the blue area 
if I were to just throw a dart and land in on the spot there, if I landed on blue, right, it's some probabilistic number. If I landed on red, it's some probabilistic number. But at the end of the day, right, we're making the assumption that I, wherever I land, it has to be within this square or this rectangle. Well, if I were to sum up both of these kind of spaces, I get a value of one, right? That is going to account for all possible situations. When we start dealing with, again, this dice roll and how we are talking about independence, right, if I looked at all the possible configurations of rolling six or rolling uh, 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 my, my values, uh, yeah, uh, all the possible numbers five times, right, because uh, I'm rolling five times, all possible sequences, right, that's going to result in some large number. Right, some uh, thousand, you know, there are seven thousand, almost eight thousand possible configurations of permutations. Well, if you do sort of the math, this is where you sit down and go, okay, well, to roll the one, 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 that that probable probability of happening is one in seven thousand or almost eight thousand, right? And there you go. That and that comes out to a very small number, right? But the problem is, because it's independent of each other, you would get the same result if you were to roll the 6, 3, 1, 5, 5. Again, because of independence in my dice roll. So in this kind of situation, right, they are equal to each other. This is where, I, I don't know why my Monte Carlo simulation font went funky, but this is where I want to introduce now Monte Carlo simulation. This is the Wikipedia article, at least when I first grabbed it. But I love just this entire methodology. I think it's hilarious, but also fun. Uh, hilarious because it's hilarious in a like dark humor kind of way that uh, the inventor of Monte Carlo simulation also built the hydrogen bomb. Right? Funny, 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 haha, -ha, right? No. Essentially, if you go and look at the history of almost all our probability, it was because of gambling. Like almost all, like the, all of it, it boils back down to somebody wanted to know if when they rolled some die, would they win money or lose money, right? And what are the chances of winning money, right? So it's hilarious in that sense. But again, uh, so Stanislav Ulam was... Uh, Playing solitaire, because solitaire is a game that you can uh, gamble on. You can gamble on anything in these days, right? Uh, but again, it's, well, given some, you know, shuffled amount of my cards, right? Given that I've shuffled this deck, without doing anything else, what's the probability that I win solitaire, Right? That's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of permutations and then draws and what's being hidden behind each spot, right? It's a big number. And so Ulam, or uh, Stanislav, when uh, he was essentially playing this game, he was at the Monte Carlo Casino and being a math person just sat down and started kind of writing a theoretical math proof to try and explain that. And it boiled down to, well, one way I could solve the approach is playing solitaire one billion times, right? He didn't physically do it, but, oh, theoretically, if I were to play a billion games of solitaire or some large number of games of solitaire, I could have an approximation of whether or not I win or lose given a shuffle. And so it's, again, very awesome to think about because, again, these are some of the... the Hallmark, uh, uh, hallmark, uh, not inventions, but like hallmark thinkings that essentially have built out our machine learning world. Um, and so again, that's where, oh, you know, what Monte Carlo is essentially doing is that. You pick what you want to see, and then you evaluate by doing it a bunch of times and evaluating. Uh, this is an example I, I've used in like CS1 a few times of like, 
oh, what if I roll, if I had to roll five numbers, because this is the original proof of like probability, is like, given five rolls, what are the chances I roll a five or a six? Would you like to gamble uh, that I, I land or do not land on a five or a six within five rolls? Uh, again, um, Pascal was the, uh, in, is considered the inventor of probability specifically because a nobleman kept losing in this game and couldn't figure out why. Uh, so essentially the, the nobleman reached out to Pascal and was like, hey, I keep losing all my money. Can you at least tell me like why so I can pick a better game to lose my money at? Uh, and well, guess what? I can, I can map it. I can, I can show it. In this case, oh, well, given those rolls, if I see that, I, I'm logging it. Notice I'm logging the success or that the event actually happening. Uh, and then if I were to map this out, you can see, you know, it's some number of trials here, just thousand, million. Uh, oh, well, let me just take, you know, however many yeses divided by how many trials I did. And I have essentially a probability of like, oh, well, I observed this many times is when it would occur. Uh, and you'll notice that this is actually a very similar approach to what you saw in simulated annealing. Maybe, you know, those connections are helping. Because what did you do? You just picked a random child. Right? You just, hey, let me just get one. I don't know if it's going to be good or bad, but let me just grab it, right? That was a little bit of Monte Carlo in action to see if it was a good result. You might know of a much more uh, uh, easy case. Every single one of your problem sets Notice your test cases. Notice one of the criteria for your test cases has always been you have to succeed 70% of the time. Because I don't know if your agent works all the time. It's actually kind of difficult, especially when you're dealing with randomness, right? So what have I done when I'm dealing with your uncertainty? I'm saying, let me just observe. Right? There are three doors. Behind one of the doors is a car. Yep. Behind the other two are goats. Right? Again, I'm uh, having a little bit of a, a visualization for you. Now, when the contestant was exp you know, accepting one of the doors, the host would then show one of the other doors, specifically the w one of them with a goat. Now, the question becomes, all right, hey, you've locked in that middle door. Do you want to switch? And why, again, this is... Read up on the history of probability because it's absolutely hilarious to watch people try and use their own brains to explain whether or not they should be winning money or they should be winning cars, right? Because when you, if you dig up the history on the Monty Hall problem, this one just like a lot of people, like it was like a nationwide kind of people could not agree with this, right? Should you make the switch? Well, this is where... In theory, yes, actually, you should make the switch. Just like uh, uh, Kevin was saying in the, the video, if you do, it actually shifts the probability because you've eliminated a, a thing. But okay, you, your, your math friend or you, your, your brain's starting to smoke and you don't understand why uh, and you don't want to start writing proofs. Okay, don't. You have the power to simulate. Again, this is a super powerful uh, skill that we, we often overlook in computer science, uh, even though it's super, super powerful. Code it out. You know? uh, luckily, I'm, I'm using sort of a modified version from Rosetta code uh, in this case. But if we were to take that same iteration, right? I have, uh, how many is that? Uh, one million uh, attempts, right? I'm going to do one million trials of the Monty Hall problem. Uh, and again, I'm going to re record. Now, I'm recording both if you switch and if you stay to see if you were successful at getting your car. Um, ooh, excuse me. I'm picking one of the doors at random. Right now, they're all uh, goats, and then I'm changing one to a car. Now, make another random, right? Oh, the contestant selects a door at random. Doesn't know. Whatever. Then just show the door. Uh, decide whether or not uh, this is me just like cheating of like, okay, well, hopefully they don't immediately uh, get the answer or something like that. I don't remember. Uh, but, 
okay, well, if they end up selecting, oh, this is a, which door you show. Don't show the car. Um, or don't show the car, don't show their one, uh, whatever. If they stay, count how many times they win. If they switch, count how many times they win. And then you can see, just like we were seeing with our problem sets, just like we can see with dice rolls, just like we can see with a lot of things, while this is not necessarily like a decision-making process and an AI being like, oh, you picked that door because X, Y, Z, you can see that we can still kind of make a mapping that if you switch, again, only based on observation, no proof whatsoever, just, again, from my magic uh, fingers writing code, uh, I was able to see the two-thirds happening, right? And it, guess what? This is where... We have the power to keep on seeing it. So it's not always, you know, the perfect two and two third chance, but we're able to observe that same probability with this. Uh, so this is again one of our, our crazy cool skills uh, that we can use to map out. One of the things I said specifically though was Monte Carlo is not necessarily AI. But why I'm kind of introducing it when we talk about uncertainty is it is heavily used in many AI situations or as a decision-making tool. Um, specifically, again, I've mentioned two-minute papers in the past, but if you, if you learn anything, it's to subscribe to Adam Goweda. Now, subscribe to two-minute papers. Uh, the, the guy is phenomenal. Uh, he's a doctor out of Switzerland now. Um, all he does is review papers uh, uh, in AI of like, here's the method that they did, and look at what they're look at the cool stuff they're doing. Uh, but specifically, this one is about uh, boom. Uh, sp specifically, this one is using how we used Monte Carlo simulation for think about it in 3D world mapping, right? Those of you in the game development world or in computer graphics, we've learned or you've been taught something called ray casting. Shoot a beam of light and try and map out and estimate all of the bounces to it. You can see that, again, this is ray casting as it happens, and this is a big computational problem in 3D graphics. But what we could do is we could actually say, well, rather than trying to map out every single one of those photons, because, again, that's, in theory, an infinite number of photons, right? What if we mapped out, uh, I'm trying to find a good cleaner, not a, there's a good one. Right, no, nope. uh, where's it? Here's one, right? If I'm only using one pixel samples, you can see, hey, these are not performing the best, but I could use like just one sample per pixel, right? One photon per pixel. Could I use that as my input for an AI? And how well does that end up rendering that same scene? Why? Because again, rather than an infinite, a theoretical infinite number of photons that I have to model and simulate, let's do one allow AI in the machine learning world that we'll get into later uh, to then map the rest of it, to answer the rest of the questions. Um, again, my point to this is more specific to the fact that Monte Carlo is the, the approach that they chose to do with this. Again, it's something that we'll see throughout uh, some of our machine learning. It's just like, oh, let's take random samples and train and learn off of just a small subset rather than that big thing that may take forever to learn. So when we're thinking about it, again, this is my kind of uh, idea or evaluation where what I'm doing is I have my mapping. I have the world. Uh, and I have, you know, you know, the probability that my universe exists, right? Well, again, theoretically, one, right? Of course it exists. But then I also have just that theory of false, like something does not exist, right? Or something does, is not true. That's a zero. Then when we start getting into some of our more complicated maths, you see that what we're essentially doing when we work off of our probabilities is we're trying to 
take these numbers, add them together, do a little subtraction, though, because we have to do that. So, again, let's imagine I do have two events that are possible, and there is some overlap between them. Right? I have a little uncertainty of, like, was something occur? you know, this green area, was that happening because of A, or was that happening because of B? Right? Well, okay, we have to start from the beginning. Well, what's the probability that this th A thing happened? Okay, it's mapped out, and you can see, uh, you know, it's, it's the blue part. But then I also have the probability of B happening, and it's the yellow part. Well... Now what I'm saying is, okay, well, what happens if both of them were to occur? It's a very small percent, right? Not only does A have to happen, but B also has to happen, and it becomes a much smaller sliver, right? Okay, fine, fair, right? You get this. Again, you took discrete math. You understood probability. Fingers crossed. But what happens when I'm dealing with or, right? One or the other occurred. So how do I map out that probability. That becomes a little bit more complex. And so what we end up doing is we essentially, the formula for figuring this part out is, all right, let's just, okay, A happened or B happened. So let's take all of A and all of B. Let's add them together. But the problem is, again, there is some theoretical overlap that I just counted twice. So my math doesn't properly add up. So I took, again, probability of A, probability of B, added them together, right? But I got to get rid of that double observation that I'm doing. So I'm subtracting it once, right? Oh, hey, I, I double dipped. Let, let's reverse the double dipping. That's where you put the chip back in the third time. Thank you. So that's where, okay, all right, fine. Let's, let's start to map these things out again. What's the probability of rolling a five or six in five rolls, right? Again, let's work off of that. Oh, okay, well, you know, five or six, there's, you know, six possible answers, but five or a six, that's, where are they? Five or six, so two over six, that's, you know, simplify our math, that's one-third of a chance, right? Okay, then we roll, so that would be, you know, one-third, to the fifth power, right? Right? Okay. Oh, I, I love that. It was a nod. Because you're wrong. <laughs> That's not how probability works. This is where we're getting a little refresher of your discrete math. Uh, because, again, what I just essentially uh, put there was like, oh, again, now there's no independence. And that's when... Uh, or sorry, I'm saying that these are starting to become dependent on each other. That becomes uh, slightly incorrect. So again, think of, this is why I really like the visualization that I have here. Hopefully it's connecting with you as well. Think about it in the sense of, well, when I roll each die, I'm rolling that die five times. And in essence, I don't need to roll a third time if on the second time I landed on a five, right? So... It rolled on a three. You just have to believe me. Right? Okay, so I have to roll it again. It rolled on a six. Once again, you just have to believe me. See, it rolled on a six. Right? I don't need to roll anymore. What I essentially, this is what that overlap and what I'm trying to visualize and represent here is happening, right? I may have things where there's overlaps going on, and how do I map out those overlaps? I don't know that, oh, I could get it in two, right? Or I could have gotten in four. I could have gotten in five. So as a consequence, what I'm trying to get at is back to the math part, right? Slightly in the proof sense. This is very difficult to evaluate, right? Especially when I'm dealing with more than just an A or a B, right? Am I talking about this overlap or this overlap where it's, I'm overlapping three occurrences or I'm overlapping four of my occurrences, right? I have no idea which overlap I need to evaluate or kind of subtract from my calculation. So we're going to take the negative instead because, again, the universe 
Right? The probability that the universe exists was one. So let's say, okay, well, I don't know where all those overlaps could be. That's a very difficult process. So rather than trying to figure out those overlaps, let's take the outer shape of it. Right? Let's just take just the theoretical negative, ugh, negative space the, the, uh, that is being presented. And let's just say, okay, let's assume we're now kind of working off of it not happening. Why? Because not happening is easier to map out than it happening. It happening, again, I got to deal with overlaps. It not happening, I don't care about overlaps. I just care about the, the bigger picture of it. What that allows me to do is go, okay, well, instead of thinking of it in there's a one in three chance of landing over five on a six, there's a two out of three chance I don't land on the five or six. Okay, fine, right? That produces some number. I'm still doing the multiplication. You see, uh, okay, it's a 13% chance I'm not going to roll a five or six. Remember, we're dealing with the, the gambler here. Again, the nobleman that kept losing money, right? Well, again, okay, I have a 13% chance of not rolling that five or six. And if I'm working off of the negative space, okay, fine. Then I would take the probability that the universe exists, and I would subtract the probability of something not happening from that. Okay, yeah. If you don't know how many sides your die has, that makes things worse. Or if it's a variable number, if it's a consistent number, that helps a little. But if you've got like a varying number on each roll, that just, you've hurt my brain. Uh, I would start by assuming the maximum uh, possible solution and then looking at the minimal possible solution. That would help a little. Uh, but at least in our case, we know six because that was, again, a rich man lost money here, people. Think about the rich man. But if we subtract that 13 from that one, then what we get is there was an 86% chance of, within five rolls, landing on a five or a six. And that's why you go to college. Questions? Who's now thinking of their rich friend to swindle? Please don't. Anyways, so this is where, okay, now we start to get into, okay, we're, we're, we're using this power in AI to make decisions. And this is where conditional probability can come into play. So in this sense, when I ask something like, well, what's the probability of A occurring if I have made an observation? I have observed that B occurred, or B has a value of blank, whatever you know, that happens to be then what I'm saying with conditional probability is, okay, since I have observed B, what's the probability A, whatever A's value turns out to be? This formula maps out then to, well, what's the probability A and B happened? Divided by what's the overall probability B happens. And what this starts to plan out is, again, we can see it's you know this mapping, and this is just me saying, uh, rewording it again. So here's sort of that example. What if I, I expand that to three variables? Now I have what's the probability A was a value, B was a value, C was a value, whatever they may be. You can see that if I were to map out all the possible configurations of this just in a true false sense with my truth table, the probabilities should all map up to 100%, right? Because it's all possible configurations that would happen. So if we're looking at this, if I were to say something like, what's the probability A is true, just A by itself, then I'm mapping, in theory, every iteration that A was true. So when A was true, B, C were true. When A was true, B, B was true, C was not. When A was true, but B was not, and C was. Or when A was true and neither B, C were true. I take all of those situations, I add them all together, and that gives me 40%, right? That A is true 40% of the time. And so how would I start to calculate out conditional probability, right? 
This is where we have a big fancy $5 word of joint probability distribution. What's the probability A and B are true, given that I have observed that C is true? Again, I don't know 100%, but I may be able to make some kind of estimation. Okay, well, again, we start to, by mapping this out to, let's make an assumption. Let's assume everything that we have seen or asked is true, right? I only know C is true. Let's assume A and B are exactly what you said they would be. They are true. Then, just what's the likelihood C was true to begin with, right? Just by itself. And it's a simple division. And so I would start to map that out, right? That first part, this is where, as you're starting to kind of, you will be asked to do this, just FYI, right? I recommend you start with the numerator because it's one of the calculations that you're going to need to do in your denominator. So in that sense, okay, well, that's my numerator. Calculate it out first. I see it's one-tenth. But then I see all the other calculations, right? And it's, again, only looking for when C was true. I take all those, right? I see the 5%, the 30%, the 5%, that 10%. I add them all together. And that would give me a 0 0.5. Okay, well, 1 or, you know, 0 0.1 divided by 0 0.5 or over 0.5 would produce a 1, a 0 0.2, yeah. 20% occurrence here. A and B have a 20% chance of being true given C was true. Okay, right, that helps. So why? Well, again, if we start to map these to not, you know, false, just arbitrary, ambiguous terms, right, I can start to make some mappings. I could use, rather than trying to make an explicit implication rule, I can make estimations of rules, right? What is the probability that a patient has a cavity given the patient is complaining about a toothache? I have an observ observation, but, right, the cavity and all that stuff, that's an expensive operation or it costs money, right? This is where uh, you list out your symptoms before you start to do expensive tests. Well, okay, we start with the assumption that both of these, op you know, these things are true, our assumption and our observation. We map that out. We see that it's 12% chance based on some, you know, uh, findings that we happen to have. Then we take, okay, well, what's the probability of a toothache just being true? 20% based on our things, right? Okay, well, now we do simple division, 12 divided by 20. And so what we would see here is that if a, pa you know, based on our model, right, if a patient is complaining about a toothache, the probability that they have a cavity, in theory, would be 60%. There's a 60% chance that that is happening. Again, you can start to use this to answer a lot of different questions. So what is the probability that they don't have a toothache given we have observed a cavity, right? In that case, you still map it out. You still take your, your assumption and your observation. You take your uh, evaluation of when cavity is just true, uh, period, so 1 in 20 chance that the patient has a cavity. Um, and then, you know, again, we map that out. The probability of not having a toothache given a cavity, 40%. These are, again, not, these are purely toy examples. That is not how it really works when you get cavities or not, okay? Please do not. I am not a dentist. I am a doctor, but not for this, and not for this, for these. We don't really have enough time. I'm just seeing where I am on time, and I do have some fun little goofy stuff at the end. So I'm going to work, yeah, work through this one with y'all. It's going to be a call and response. So please, for the sake of time, work with me here. So we have, OK, I have the probability of A being true, B being false, C being false, or given that I have seen that C is false. OK, well, again, we map that out to now A is true, B is not true, C is not true, over the probability that C is not true, right? OK, well, again, let's focus on our numerator 
First, what is the probability of A true, B, C, not true? 1 point, or not 1, 0.05. Thank you. Boom. Easy peasy. Lemon squeezy, right? But then I go and I map out the next other ones. And this is where I'm going to just map out where those are. So we got a C being false, a C being false, C being false, C being false. So we got that 0 0.5. I'd map out my 0 0.2. And for someone who's got a calculator quickly at hand, please make sure to give me like the fractional or the, the actual decimal amount uh, while I write out the formula. Five. And so again, we've got that 0 0.05 over 25, 35. And even if you still need a calculator for that, what is our probability? 0 0.1. 10% chance that A is true, B is false, given that we observe C is false. So again, we have, there you are, assumptions. We are, what is the probability if we assume these things are the values that we make as our assumptions, given what we have actually observed uh, in our space, whatever that happens to be. Why we present this? Again, why did I even present all of this stuff about probability and doing math? And this is, again, this is where our witchcraft skill set comes into play, right? This is where you hear a term like A-B testing. Again, we have sort of that same approach, right? What's the probability that a user would click on a call to action button for web design? This is heavily, heavily used, right? Well, it's not AI, but it sort of gets thrown into the category of AI because something, you know, right? A machine made a decision on what it shows me and that general public thinks that's AI. It's just math, right? Again, well, I have these two different probabilities and A-B testing is we're going to use this call to action button to determine which one was the better outcome, the best choice. Now, what you would do is essentially you're going to structure it in the, that approach of like, okay, you pick a set number of trials, right? That same kind of occurrence going on here. And once again, you're going to map out how often was it a success, right? In web design world or in web world, success would be click rate. How often does what you present get clicked on? Right? And you would map that. Maybe in this case, 10 out of your 16 occurrences, the blue version got clicked on. But then what? You make a slight change, one simple change, because we're doing the scientific method. Let's change it to red. OK, well, what? We, we do the same experiment over one variable change, the color of the button. We map out. This time, we only got five. Oh, look at that. Now we've got, again, the probabilities of these of one versus the other approach, right? Because there is no answer to which one's better, but we do show users tend to click on the blue version uh, more. And so, again, this is where which one do you choose to keep, right? Which, as you're kind of building out your websites or, you know, uh, your designs, which approach do you do? Right? There's what you think as an artist, right? I use certain designs as an artist, but then there's which ones kind of are tangible. Can you map them in some way? Data-driven evidence is the term currently getting thrown around in academia. Or you run another test, right? Okay, that was one test. That's another test. Do another test. You can keep on doing tests. It's not, you know, again, uh, if you have a high enough trafficked uh, environment, you can do so. Um, but that's where there is actually a limitation because what happens if experiment two is going very badly, right, at the start? How do you know, should you jump ship? Should you abandon ship if, like, within the first, just because I have one video that's getting a lot of dislikes? Should I just immediately delete it? 
because it's already being poorly received on the internet within the first X number of days? Well, no, if you're doing A-B testing, you got to roll through it. You don't abandon ship immediately. You have to play it out the entire time to see if it's a success. That's where I present an alternative. Uh, this term often does get touted around as uh, A-B testing as well, but I'm seeing where my time is, so I kind of have to do a little bit more rapid firing. The analogy here, again, more gambling because probability is all about gambling. You're an octopus at a casino. You have eight slot machines and eight arms. Which one do you pull next? Because you, know, you got to put money in, right? Well, again, right, this is where, okay, we can make another analogy. Let's assume I'm trying to do this with YouTubes, right? You know, this is a, a I'm, how would I optimize it? I have the YouTube face approach that you all are now saying sh I should do. No. I have my using just gen, gen AI'd close up of an ant. I have what I am actually using. And I have my old classic. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. I, what we just did is a survey. Again, that's preference, but that is not tangible. Right? I can't prove, right? Oh, y'all like. I don't because I was 30 pounds heavier there, and YouTube adds 10 more pounds. <laughs> My point being, what am I doing with multi, uh, multi arm bandit theory? We start by assuming they're all going to be successful. Each one has a 100% chance of success. The user would click on the video. Then when we are presented with the user going to the page, essentially we just find which one we have the highest assumption or the highest expectation of success. Right now, again, they are all mapped at 100%, so you pick how you decide tiebreakers, but I'm picking the one you all want, right? Okay, fine. Well, let's assume because it's YouTube O-Face and that's not what you're looking for when you're trying to you know, learn. That's for, your, that's for entertainment. You're trying to do learning, not edutainment. That's not what I do, even though that's what, right? Let's assume that they don't click on it. Okay, well, what do we do? In that case, you update the heuristic, right? Oh, now I have a second observation. So the likelihood of this being successful is now 50% chance. That's okay. Well, what do I do next? Right? That's just one user. New user comes in. I repeat the process. Do it again this time. Pick a different one that has your expected highest value. In this case, the Gen AI big old ant. Let's assume that the user clicked on this one. Okay. You log how many times you've presented this, and you log how many times it was successful. So it stays this way. But, okay, fine, you do this over and over again. And again, remember that you're dealing with the law of large numbers. So as I continue to track, I start to see, turns out a lot of things don't get clicked on the internet, right? And if I continue to map these things out, I would find some small probabilities. These are more realistic. In fact, this is still not realistic uh, given my search history, or not search history, given my analytics. That's, yeah, the analytics. I don't have enough time to pull them up, so just assume, right? Again, what this does, though, is this shows me, right, this is a data-driven, what would often get touted as AI, approach to something as simple as thumbnail design. What's interesting is this is, in fact, what Netflix and YouTube, well, Netflix does it, right? Because Netflix is like a, their own entity. And this is a great article that just goes into like how they try and decide what thumbnail to present you. Because you notice how the thumbnail changes all the time. In fact, they see that for uh, certain, I think for animated movies, I think it's discussed here, for animated movies, it's better to show the villain in the thumbnail for whatever reason, right? That, that generates higher clicks out of people. Uh, should you always do it? I don't know. It probably changes depending on the person. Right? You've got to map out a lot of different things. So when you pick them, obviously, it, okay, which one do you take as your approach? Both work. You'll often, again, hear A-B testing. It is very commonly used. It's very seen. Multi-arm bandit theory, 
also does the same approach, but you notice that it's essentially updating its weights the entire time. Now, just for the sake of time, I don't have enough to explain it. You can come up after and I can explain it. I will say, yes, both problems still kind of deal with, like, yeah, your, your best solutions, if they're the first things presented, kind of will start to sway your results. That's, yes, we don't have a better solution, but I only have 10 seconds. So, yeah, but next class will blow you away. Have a good one, ladies and gentlemen. I will see you on Wednesday.